Adverse selection as a close cousin. Insurers have long known that people who buy insurance are more likely to take risks. Someone with car insurance is more likely to leave his keys in the parked car or someone with home insurance will check their smoke alarms less often, might even go ahead and not replace them in time. Economists caught onto this problem way back in the early 60s and called it moral hazard. Moral hazard is when one party has an incentive to behave differently or take on more risk once an agreement is made between the two parties. So as you can see in all my examples that I referred to, once you have the insurance, you are typically taking now more risk than you otherwise would have. In terms of the time frame, the key element is that moral hazard occurs after the transaction has taken place. In the case of financial markets, the hazard is that the borrower will engage in undesirable or immoral activities which will shoot up the probability of default. Moral hazard is also referred to as the principal agent problem and is primarily seen in our equity contracts. Now in your equity contracts, we have stockholders or the principal agents who have typically less information about the firm or the way it is being run. And the other party are your agents or the managers of the firm which inherently have more information because they are dealing with the daily operations of the firm and how it is being managed. The problem arises because of the separation of ownership and control of the firm. Managers may act in their own interest rather than the interest of the shareholders because they have less incentive to maximize profits and a higher incentive to pursue personal benefits. In order to see this, Let's look at this profile over here. The expected profits will starkly differ when we have a firm with a lazy manager versus a hardworking manager. If I have a lazy manager for the firm, the probability of getting a lower profit, 10,000 is now much higher, whereas the probability of getting a higher profit is considerably lower it's only 40%. In the event that you have a hardworking manager, your probability of getting a lower profit is now a lot lower, 20%. And if you have a hardworking manager, it increases your probability of getting a higher profit outcome many fold to 80%. Even without doing any calculations, we can immediately see that our expected profit for the firm will depend upon our manager's behavior. And in this case, we're assuming it's Steve. If Steve is hardworking, our expected profit will be typically higher just based on our overall probabilities over here. And if Steve is lazy, our expected profitability starkly goes down. And we can calculate the expected profit for each case over here. So I have the probability weighted average for the profits of the firm in the event that Steve is lazy and that would be $26,000. And I can also similarly calculate my expected profit for the firm if my manager Steve is hardworking. In this case, you can see I have an 80% chance that I will be getting $50,000 and that overall increases my number. So I can immediately tell this number will be much higher than 26,000. And if you calculate the probability weighted average in this case, it'll give you $42,000. As shareholders of the firm, you obviously want this particular outcome and not this one when Steve is lazy or is slacking off. So how do we ensure Steve does not slack off and is always putting in his maximum effort? In the event that I give my manager always a fixed pay, which is not tied to his effort, it's more likely that Steve will not be pushed to put in any additional effort and pursue these higher profits. However, if I tie his payoff to his performance at my firm, I can induce Steve to work a lot harder. So the idea over here is give Steve some percentage of profit, so tie his salary to the profitability of the firm in order to induce him to work hard. So I can offer him some fixed percentage of the profits. Now, if this fixed percentage is always, let's say 10%, I know Steve would rather be working hard and not slacking off because overall 10% of 42,000 is obviously higher than 10% of 26,000. But what is that minimum amount that I need to offer him? We can actually calculate that minimum amount that we need to offer Steve by simply ensuring that his payoff will always be higher under the hardworking outcome and not under the lazy outcome. So his fixed percentage share of profits from 42,000 should be higher than his percentage share when the firm is making $26,000. Steve will also have some personal cost when he is working hard, we must take that into account. So he could have a personal cost of let's say $2,000 or $10,000. We can ensure that their personal cost is over here. Typically, if you're shirking or you're just using Facebook all day, we can assume that personal costs in this case are very low or almost equal to zero. Setting up this problem, now we can solve for the minimum fixed percentage required for us to incentivize Steve to always work hard and not shirk as the manager of our corporation. So 
tying your manager's payoffs to the profitability of the firm was one way of reducing the moral hazard. We can also look at some other tools for reducing moral hazard and these can include monitoring. So I could always monitor Steve. Monitoring means that you're observing Steve's behavior at all times. Now, obviously this is quite costly. In a more realistic, broader sense, it would require auditing firms more frequently, checking on your management randomly. Now, monitoring is quite expensive and it also involves the free riding problem. The free riding problem will arise over here because some shareholders will be paying for monitoring and the shareholders who are not paying for this monitoring or who don't want to pay, they are still enjoying the profits arising out of this monitoring being done on their behalf. And therefore, we will see not enough monitoring being done in the first place. No one wants to take on the cost, the benefits of which are being enjoyed by a much larger pool of people. People typically want the costs also to be split equally. So if that is not possible, we will overall see too much free riding and therefore not enough monitoring being done in our equity contracts. Therefore, it again leads us towards the role of government in our equity markets in providing information or trying to increase inf information through regulation. Governments can implement laws to adhere to standard accounting principles. Governments can also impose criminal penalties in the event of fraudulent activities. Then we have the role of financial institutions again. Typically, we see small, unknown, but high growth companies do not have access to financial markets directly. Investors do not know these companies and do not trust them enough to buy their newly issued stocks and bonds. Venture capital firms will therefore come in, provide the equity and place their own people in the management, thereby reducing the moral hazard problem, while also providing the small business with the much needed financial capital. A fourth possibility for reducing moral hazard in your equity contracts is simply replace them with debt contracts. Remember, debt contracts pay a fixed amount to lenders and borrowers keep the profits over and above. So in the case of the debt contract, as a lender, you don't need to worry about the behavior of the borrower after you have lent him his money as long as he's paying you back your fixed payment. That's why we also saw in a bar graph that bonds market had a bigger share of external financing for businesses compared to newly issued stocks. However, remember debt contracts are not without their own set of moral hazard problems. In debt contracts, we see sometimes the borrower will end up taking even higher risk. So for example, your friend is borrowing $10,000 from you and he agrees to pay you this money back at 10% one year from now. Let's assume at the time the contract was made, your friend told you that he's going to use these funds to open an ice cream shop. Seems like a pretty safe investment with very low risk of default and therefore a higher likelihood of you getting your money back in one year's time. However, if your friend realizes that if he was to use these funds in order to pursue a much riskier project, which will end up making him a millionaire, for example, he puts the money in some chemical research equipment to invent diet ice cream. Now, the probability of that happening is very low, but in the event that he is successful, he ends up becoming a millionaire. Now, that's a strong incentive for your friend to use the funds for the riskier opportunity and not for the safer project. For you, it increases the likelihood of default many fold. If you know that your friend is likely to pursue this riskier opportunity, you might go ahead and never lend him these funds in the first place. So as soon as you decide not to lend him the funds because of the moral hazard associated, the contract collapses or the market collapses and now funds are no longer being exchanged. So we see inefficiencies arising in our debt markets also because of moral hazard problems. How do we reduce moral hazard in our debt contracts? The idea over here is to somehow ensure that your friend or borrowers will not engage in activities that increase the risk of default. One way of doing that could be posting collateral. Just like collateral reduce the problem of adverse selection, collateral will also play a huge role in reducing moral hazard. If the borrower posts collateral and the bigger the collateral is, the more he has at stake. So this is called more skin in the game. With more skin in the game, the temptation to act in immoral manner for the borrower will be greatly reduced. Likewise for net worth, greater the net worth, greater is the borrower's incentive to behave in an appropriate manner and therefore smaller is the moral hazard problem. And once you have reduced the moral hazard problem overall because of the posted collateral or higher net worth, we see it's easier for the borrower to borrow money in this market. However, smaller the net worth or smaller the pledged collateral, we see higher moral hazard and therefore more difficult to borrow funds in that market. Second way to reduce moral hazard problems in your debt contracts is through monitoring and enforcement of restrictive covenants. Now, monitoring is quite problematic like we saw in our equity contracts. Monitoring is very costly and involves the free riding problem. Here again also, if you do have 
have lots of bond holders and not all of them are doing the monitoring we will end up with some free riders once bond holders realize there are some free riders the incentive to do monitoring by the others will also go down and overall we'll see not enough monitoring will be done restrictive covenants are restrictions on the behavior of the borrower which are already stipulated in the contract which you have made with the borrower restrictive covenants also have to be enforced so you have to ensure that the borrower is adhering to those rules and restrictions that you have put in place these could be in terms of let's say the corporation is not going to pay out any dividends it could be in terms of you're not allowed to take on any additional loans it could be in terms of how much percentage share that you're giving in terms of dividend payments etc so there could be many type of restrictions that can be placed however the problem over here is of enforcement if you're not monitoring and enforcing the restrictions on the behavior of the borrower we will see moral hazard persisting and thriving in this market so how do we reduce moral hazard when we do not have enough monitoring mechanisms in place this brings again the role of financial intermediation or financial institutions because of the economies of scale they have the facilities to monitor and enforce restrictive covenants on all borrowers that they are dealing with they can avoid the free riding problem by making private loans this leads to the reduction of moral hazard in debt contracts and this again explains why financial intermediation or indirect finance plays such a huge role in our external financing for businesses in comparison to direct finance which has a much smaller share in raising external funds for businesses so that brings us to the end of the discussion of what moral hazard and adverse selection are in our next chapter we'll see how financial institutions themselves can be subject to adverse selection and moral hazard problems and therefore what is the role that regulators are going to play in order to reduce moral hazard and adverse selection not just for borrowers out there but primarily for these financial institutions that are in our economics system.